to do. <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, I want us to uh, jump into the book of Isaiah. And uh, we're going to pick up with a story that happens in, uh, in the life of good King Hezekiah. This is towards the end of Hezekiah's life. Y'all remember, Hezekiah was struck with a killer disease of some type. And he prayed to God, and God came and allowed Hezekiah 15 more years of life. And in Isaiah chapter 39, Isaiah gives us this historical reference. This is also in Kings and Chronicles. And Isaiah tells us, at the time of Merodach Baladon, son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent letters and a gift to Hezekiah. Now, remember, the Assyrians have conquered the northern tribes. The, the Israelites are taken away into Assyrian captivity. A horrible, cruel way to go. The Assyrians were vicious. In fact, we had talked before, Assyrians were the inventors, they say, of crucifixion. Now, <clears throat> he sent a gift to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased. He would be pleased. I understand why Hezekiah was pleased. Babylon was a strong ally. You would seek out a strong ally. But Hezekiah had been warned not to have an alliance with the Babylonians. Hezekiah was pleased and he let these emissaries into his treasure house to see all. They saw all the silver. They saw all the gold, the balsam oil, the excellent olive oil, his entire armory, and everything that was to be found in his treasuries. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his realm, that Hezekiah did not let them see. God's not happy. God comes and tells Isaiah. And Isaiah the prophet comes to King Hezekiah and says, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. Then Isaiah said, What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, They've seen everything. That is in my house. There is nothing among my treasuries that I have not let them see. Isaiah then said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord, the Lord of armies. Behold, the days are coming when everything that is in your house and everything that your fathers have stored up to this day, that's all your capital. Everything will be carried away to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons who will come from you, whom you will father, they will be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. You remember some of those people? Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. There you go. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel, mm -hmm. right? Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, There will at least be peace and truth in my days. Well, Hezekiah went to sleep with his fathers. And as good as King Hezekiah was, his son Manasseh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The exact opposite? The exact opposite. 
every high place that Hezekiah had torn down, Manasseh set up. Manasseh brought in an Asherah into the temple. It was not good times. Not good times. And then Judah slowly spirals from king to king, going further down. There was King Josiah. He was a bright spot, but it just kept getting worse. And finally, God said, their sin is as bad as the sin of the Amorites. And who showed up? But the Babylonians. And they laid siege to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem fell. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, did just what Isaiah had prophesied. And carried away wave after wave of the Judah into Babylon. Well, how long were they going to be there? How long were they going to be there? 70 years. years. That's good. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah was prophesied and told them, for this is what the Lord says. When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you, and I will bring you back to this place. This is the verse you hear most often. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster, to give you a future, to give you a hope. Just a quick aside. I love... 29 verse 11 we always need to first and foremost keep these prophecies in the context and to the people that they were given mm -hmm. this was given to those who were carried away as verse 10 says into Babylon does God have good plans for you we pray that that's true first and foremost this is not speaking directly to us. But, back to our story. They would be in captivity for 70 years. That's a long, long time. And that's a hard time to be in captivity. You're not going to have all good times enslaved to the Babylonians. And Isaiah knows that. And God knows that. And God came to Isaiah and said, I want you to prophesy comfort. In fact, he says it twice. I want you to comfort, comfort my people. It's very important that we keep hope. What you said is exactly right. Hope is what is necessary for us to have faith. The children of Israel needed hope. This was not going to come from within. This was going to be a salvation that they were not capable of bringing about of their own accord. And that's exactly what the history tells us. After Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus came into power, right? And Cyrus decided to send some of these people back. Now, how do we keep their hope alive until those 70 years are up? So God in, says in verse 3 and 4 of Isaiah 40, the voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So he's telling these captives, there will be a time where your God will come and you need to be ready and you need to prepare his way. Now, there's a double application here, isn't there? Who do you think of when you read this passage? John the Baptist. Let every valley be lifted up. 
Let every mountain and hill be made low. Let the uneven ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. That was John the Baptist's mission also, to get the way ready for his cousin. Well, let's go back to the captives. In verse 11 of chapter 40, Isaiah tells them, Your king will be like a shepherd. He will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather those lambs and carry them in the fold of his robe. He will gently lead the nursing you. Steve, this makes me think of that loving father. Who do you think of in verse 11? <coughs> Jesus. <coughs> Jesus. Like Carl said last two weeks ago, the good shepherd. <laughs> the good shepherd is who we think of when we read verse 11. Those captives. Hmm. What does he tell them here about their God? You know, if you had been carried away or if you were born into captivity, whose God would you think is stronger? Yours or Nebuchadnezzar's? This is how the ancient mind would work. You would come against me in battle. I would pray to my God. You would pray to your God. I would sacrifice to my God. You would sacrifice to your God. And then we would fight it out. And whoever won, their God was more powerful. Now you're born into captivity. What does God want you to know about him? Well, the God of Judah, he reduces rulers to nothing. He can make the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they even been planted, have they been sown, scarcely have they taken root when God simply blows and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. That wouldn't be easy to convince your children of when you're in captivity. How would you do that? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he doesn't become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary and to the one who lacks might, he increases It's the word. You're going to raise those kids up by the word of God. You're going to teach them all of these truths about God, and they will find those in their life. That time will come. But this is where we're going to park. This verse was sent to me this week. This is where we're going to park for a little bit. Yet those who wait for the Lord, those who wait, I get tired of waiting. And this used to confuse me. Some of the translations say, yet those who hope on the Lord. <clears throat> wait, I think, is better. Yet those who wait for the Lord. They were going to be waiting decades. The word wait in Hebrew is kavah. 
This word means you gather together. You see, there's a difference in how we wait. There is an idle waiting, and there is an active waiting. Do you remember in your life when you became old enough to wait in the car? <laughs> Not anymore. Used to be able to. I was probably ten. Yeah, I was probably ten years old. I can't remember the circumstances why I had been banished to my grandmother's care. <laughs> but I was in the car with my mama Jack. Okay. And uh, she was on her way to the beauty parlor. I had experienced the beauty parlor before. And it was not your cup of tea, was it? I hated the beauty parlor. <laughs> Because I did not understand the language spoken in the beauty parlor, nor the scary machines that came down onto their heads. <laughs> the bleach smell. The smell was atrocious. There was nothing in the beauty parlor for me. And I'm sure safety was put aside. My grandmother said, you can wait in the car. Waiting in the car was what I chose. But I cranked down that window because you die otherwise in the state of Florida. No. <laughs> and I sat in that hot vinyl seat, sweating, with absolutely no entertainment. The best time out ever. <laughs> and I waited, and I waited. It felt like hours. I would assume that it was 45 minutes to an hour. I'm not sure. It was miserable. It was miserable. Waiting. Hey, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> and to pour salt into the wound, this particular grandmother was a health nut. There would be no ice cream treat <laughs> after this wait. The best you could hope for was a sugar-free hard candy. Smooth. Look, waiting on the Lord is not an idle waiting. It wasn't for those captives and it's not for us. When we wait, we are to be busy gathering together. We are to be patient, but we are, and this is where I really want to stick, we are to bind together. This word originally meant to twist like a rope. Like a rope you twist together as you're waiting on the Lord. And I love this idea because how are you going to teach your kids? You're going to teach them the commandments of the Lord. You're going to teach them the word. You're going to teach them the rituals. You're going to bind all of those together and you're going to keep building that rope because that rope is what ties them all the way back to Jerusalem, you see. That's how they're going to find their way home. This is what's placed around Ezra and Nehemiah when they return to the land. They've been waiting on the Lord. They've been binding these things. And the same holds true for us. You know, when they were captive, they were bound. You always bind the hands of your prisoners. Nobody goes to jail 
without cuffs. But back then, they were tied with rope. They were held captive with rope. They had to make the rope to get home with. <clears throat> This is sin. You talk to any addict, and they will say, I was a prisoner to heroin. It bound me. It controlled my life. It destroyed my life. I lost my family. I lost my career. I lost my wealth. Because my hands were tied. Do you know who the army guy is? This is Desmond Doss. Learn that in Boy Scout. This is the rope of salvation. <coughs> if you have not watched the movie Hacksaw Ridge, if you don't know the story of what happened at Hacksaw Ridge, and this is the cliff. This is a battle that took place during World War II between our troops and the Japanese. And they had to climb up a rope ladder to the top and there the battle took place. It was a horrendous, horrendous battle. Desmond Doss was a Seventh-day Adventist who would not pick up a weapon. He was a pacifist. But he wanted to be in the army and do his part. They court-martialed him because he wouldn't shoot a weapon. He won that. They said, if you go into battle, you're not going to live. He said, I only want to help and save people. I want to be a medic. Well, that night he climbed up, or that day he climbed up with his troop B. And it was annihilation. And they retreated. Desmond stayed up top. He did not suffer death. And he snuck around the whole night. Picking men up who had been shot and wounded. And placing this particular knot around them. And lowering them down the side of that cliff to safety. Our troops would then take them and ship them back to the medics. The Japanese were up top the whole night, killing anyone who was left. He was hiding. Desmond hid. Desmond would pray over and over, let me find one more. Let me find one more. He even lowered some Japanese troops. There's two types of rope. Your children need a good, strong rope. You need a good, strong rope rope listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 6 you have been freed from sin your hands were bound by sin Paul says, you've been freed from sin. Free to just do whatever you want?
you are now enslaved to God. You're going to serve somebody. Bob Dylan said it. You're either going to serve the devil or you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to be bound by a rope. It's either going to be a rope that leads to salvation or it's going to be a rope that binds you, destroys you, and takes everything from you. You derive your benefit from this rope it results in sanctification and it leads back to Jerusalem it leads to the new Jerusalem to the heavenly city Benaiah's ring doesn't doesn't affect you here this will not pass. This is eternal. The wages of sin is death. The gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do you break that rope? When is that rope taken off your hands? Well, I would say you go back to the beginning of chapter 6 and look at that, right? What, is, what does Paul tell us in the beginning of chapter 6, Jim? Where do we find salvation? In Christ. In Christ. Where you're baptized into his death, raised to new life. All right, guys. So, let's be busy waiting on the Lord. Finish up this verse. For when you wait on the Lord, you will gain new strength. You will mount up like eagle's wings. You will run and not get tired. You will walk and not become weary. Do you remember what it felt like when you were baptized? Do you remember that day? What a great day that was. What a great day that was. You felt like you could fly. Did you not? What do we see in Hebrews? There's a run for every one of us. Don't get weary. Don't stop. You got to finish that run. And what do we often pray for? but to walk in the steps of Jesus. We sing about that. We pray for that. We seek to do that. So let's take that with us this week. If anybody here at any time makes the decision that they want to cut those ropes of sin, you let us know that the waters of baptism stand here ready Every day, regardless of the time of day, you call. We'll be there. We'll be there.